Hi, welcome back to Kirstie's Virtual Classroom. Today we're talking about metamorphic rocks, which is the last rock type that we will talk about in this course. Okay, so metamorphic rocks form from metamorphism. Metamorphism is when a rock is being transformed by heat and pressure. So both of those things have to happen in order for a metamorphic rock to form. So metamorphic rocks are transformed from existing sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, or the further alteration of metamorphic rocks. So this goes back to the rock cycle here. Okay, so as far as looking at where these form in the crust, remember sedimentary rocks formed at or near the Earth's surface, igneous rocks form deep in the crust, and then metamorphic rocks form in a very narrow zone where heat and pressure will alter the rock, but not completely melt the rock. And so this occurs between 10 and 50 kilometers. When you get down to 50 kilometers, the rocks start to melt. And before 10 kilometers, the pressure and the heat are not great enough to actually alter the rock physically and or chemically. So metamorphism occurs between 10 and 50 kilometers. So we just, we just looked at that. And that is because at 50 kilometers, the felsic minerals start to melt. So those are your quartz, your muscovites, your plagioclase. Everything that is rich in silica is felsic, and those start to um, melt at 50 kilometers. Okay, so once the melting starts, it is no longer metamorphic. So the rocks that are being metamorphosed, they stay solid during metamorphism. Okay, they do not melt. If they melt, we consider them igneous rocks. Heat is the most important agent in driving the recrystallization of new stable minerals. So when a rock is buried deep in the earth and gets to that 10 kilometer mark, it starts to recrystallize. And that recrystallization changes the rock from whatever it started as, sedimentary, igneous, or previous metamorphic, into a new metamorphic rock. And the minerals are more stable um, than they were previously. And the sources of this heat can be just from friction of moving bodies of rock, being deeper in the earth also increases the heat and the intruding magma that may be nearby. And we'll talk about how all of those things will give you different types of metamorphic rocks. So with increasing depth, you have increasing heat and you have increasing pressure. So there's something called the geothermal gradient, which is the temperature increase per every kilometer you go into the earth. So for every kilometer you go down into the earth, the temperature increases by 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, so then you can calculate based on where you are in the earth or where the rock is in the earth, approximately what the geothermal um, temperature would be. Pressure also increases with increasing depth, like I said, um, and pressure can be applied either equally or in all directions. Um, equally in all directions or differentially, excuse me. So in all directions, that would be confining pressure. That's like pressure from every side of the rock that is considered confining pressure or sometimes called lithostatic pressure. Okay, those are some terms you're gonna to wanna to remember. If the rock is being applied pressure from just two sides or differentially, that is directed pressure. So it would be directed pressure from two sides and it will do a little bit different things to the rock and I'll show you what it'll do in a second. So if the stress originates from all sides of the rock, the rock just gets more compact and smaller. If the pressure or the stress is from two sides, which is directed pressure, you get these wavy lines. So you start to see your horizontal strata or your horizontal rock start to become more and more wavy. Um, and that is from the differential stress or directed pressure from two sides. Okay, in lab you'll watch a video um, of me kind of perform a little science experiment on Play-Doh and sprinkles and looking at when you apply directed pressure, what happens to those sprinkles. Okay. So directed pressure causes rocks to become more folded and then the minerals start to reorient themselves and they reorient themselves perpendicular to the line of stress and they are parallel to each other. So they're perpendicular to the line of stress or where the pressure is originating, 
parallel to each other and they form something called foliation. So foliation is when minerals recrystallize perpendicular to that directed pressure. Okay. If the minerals are flat, like the micas, so like muscovite and biotite, their parallel orientation gives kind of a layered look. So it looks like there's layers in the rock. And so you can see the foliation really easily in something that has a mica in it. So here's an example of directed pressure foliation. So um, before metamorphism, this is a granite. It has interlocking black and white crystals. After metamorphism and directed stress, directed pressure, you see stress from two sides. The minerals start to align themselves perpendicular to that line of stress and parallel to each other. And so you get this black and white banding in something we call a gneiss, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. So granite will metamorphose to gneiss. And they look virtually identical with the exception of the randomness in uh, the crystal formation in granite versus the kind of pattern look in gneiss. That is their big difference. And the fact that gneiss has experienced much more pressure and temperature changes than granite has. Slate is a low-grade metamorphism of mud. So that was showing you crystals. This is showing you what would happen if mud was in the sample. So if you just have like a shale, and that shale that has the clay particles in it is experiencing directed pressure, those particles will then align themselves parallel to each other, perpendicular to the stress, which will create the same effect, which is the foliation, but they're grains of sand or clay, excuse me, and not necessarily crystals. They still create the foliation and you see some sheeting along those parallel planes um, because where the minerals or the grains are now parallel to each other, it weakens the rock. And so oftentimes metamorphic rocks are very much more susceptible to landslides because they have been weakened by the foliation. Um, and that's only when you see foliated rocks, foliated metamorphic rocks necessarily. Okay, so I want you guys to think about whether you see foliation in these rocks or you don't see. I tried to pick some pretty obvious ones. Um, so take a look at these samples and decide whether you think it has foliation or it doesn't. And you can pause the video and think about it if you need a second. Okay, so let's go to these individually. So number 35 here. This looks kind of like shale did in um, some of the other pictures I showed you with sedimentary rocks. Um, but you notice that it looks like it kind of has some layers to it, and that is the foliation. So 35 does have foliation. Okay, let's look at 41. 41 doesn't look like it has any particular layers to it. The crystals don't look like they're in these uh, nice kind of stripes. So I would say that 41 is non-foliated. Same thing with 42. 42 looks like all interlocking crystals. You don't necessarily see any layers to the crystals or the grains. So 42 would also be non-foliated. 36, though, you can kind of see the layering, right? You see black, white, black, white, black, white. That is the layering in the different crystals. So that is foliation, okay? And then we look at number 37. 37, you can also see the layers. These are micas, so they're very small, much smaller than the quartz and horn blends that you see here. And so they are foliated into these layers as well. So 37 is also foliated. 44, though, you don't see any layering. Um, you actually don't even see any crystals. We'll talk about what this guy is in a little bit. But um, it is non-foliated. So 41, 42, and 44 are non-foliated. 35, 36, and 37 are foliated. Okay, so make sure that you can recognize that at least in these um, fairly obvious photographs. Let's talk about metamorphic settings. So you're going to see different rocks formed in different settings. So we have three basic settings that we will discuss. The first is contact metamorphism, then we have hydrothermal, and we have regional. So in contact and hydrothermal, these are both going to yield non-foliated metamorphic rocks. In regional metamorphism, that's where we're going to see our foliated metamorphic rocks. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these individually. Here's a diagram to kind of get you acquainted with it. 
um, but I have a diagram for each. So contact metamorphism is where magma that is trying to make its way to the surface, either through a volcano or it's in a pluton, it is baking whatever it's in coming in contact with. So the rock or the host rock, you might see the country rock, the rock that is already existing and solidified and cooled that is being touched by the magma chamber is being cooked by the magma chamber. It's being altered by the magma chamber. So the effects of the metamorphism from the contact with the magma chamber is most affected in whatever is actually touching. So the closest it is, the closer it is to the magma chamber, the more affected it will be. And the further you get from it, some of these rocks don't even get affected by the magma chamber metamorphism. Okay, so contact metamorphism is from a magma chamber coming in contact with existing rock and altering it. Okay, so most of this is heat driven. Okay, it's a very low pressure situation, high temperature. Okay, high temperature, low pressure. Moving on to hydrothermal metamorphism, this is where you see at a divergent plate boundary magma upwelling. And if we're deep under the ocean, there is pressure enough to change the rock slightly with the heat present from the magma. So the magma will rise up into where the water is, so at the surface, um, below the water, and it will change the water into a very hot situation, and the hot water will alter the rocks that are on the seafloor. Oftentimes this is basalt, and the basalt will alter to something like a serpentine. A serpentine is a green rock that is very slippery, um, it is a metamorphic rock from an igneous rock that is basalt, and it only forms from hydrothermal metamorphism where you have hot, iron-rich water from the magma mantle, and it is altering the rocks that are already existing on the ocean floor. Okay, so this happens at a mid-ocean ridge where you have a divergent plate boundary. Now, moving on to regional metamorphism, so remember the other two, hydrothermal and contact, form non-foliated metamorphic rocks. Regional metamorphism will, will form your foliated metamorphic rocks because you're, you have pressure from two sides, and that pressure comes from convergent plate boundaries. So in one example, we have a continental-continental collision. So two continental pieces of crust are colliding, two continental plates are colliding, and they fold these very large mountain ranges. So like some examples are the Alps, the Himalayas, the Appalachians. All of those are very vastly folded mountain ranges from the continental continental collision. So from that compression stress, right? Stress from two sides, okay? So before um, regional metamorphism occurs, you have two continental crusts here. So you have one on this side and one on this side. And as soon as they push together, you see the uplift of the mountains. And then below the surface, there is deformation of the rocks at a high pressure and high semi-high temperature situation. So most of the driving factor in a continental-continental collision is from the pressure between the two continents pushing together. Okay, so you'll see folded mountain ranges and metamorphic rocks below um, the surface. Most of the surface rocks are gonna be whatever the rocks were on the continents before the collision, okay? And then at depth, you're going to see the alteration of those rocks into metamorphic rocks. All right, and then the other example would be in a subduction zone. So in a subduction zone, there are a lot of different things occurring, right? So this is a continental oceanic collision. And when a continent and an oceanic crust collide, the oceanic crust dives back down into the mantle. It subducts beneath the continental crust. And that takes with it water, which allows the magma in the asthenosphere to melt and rise and form the continental volcanoes. So when that magma is rising, it is giving more contact metamorphism. So contact metamorphism will also be found in a subduction zone, right, where you have magma upwelling. So you can have high temperature, high pressure in deep magma. And then you can have high temperature, low pressure in shallower magma, okay? But these are both contact metamorphism in here. Now, where you get your um, 
foliated metamorphic rocks are going to be in this low temperature, high pressure zone, which is really close to the trench where the accretionary wedge is being created. So remember the accretionary wedge is when um, the rocks that are going down back down into the mantle are being dragged by the continental plate and scraped off and they accumulate in this trench in the meeting point between the oceanic plate and the continental plate. And so you kind of get a mishmash of material that are being altered at a high pressure zone but a low temperature zone and so they are being metamorphosed in that area okay so to give you a little listing of that so you have a high pressure low temperature zone near the trench so that's where the two con or the two plates are meeting you have a high temperature low pressure zone near an igneous activity that is in shallow crust or shallow lithosphere and then you have a high pressure, high temperature zone deep in the lithosphere in the uppermost mantle area, and you have igneous activity nearby, so a magma chamber is upwelling. Okay. So here's another look at that, just to give you a different viewpoint. In this accretionary wedge area is where you have your low temperature, high pressure metamorphism. That's where your foliated metamorphic rocks are formed. And then near the magma upwelling, you have high temperature, high pressure deep in the lithosphere. And then you have high temperature, low pressure metamorphism in um, the shallower crust or shallower lithosphere. Okay. So this is regional metamorphism in a subduction zone. Okay, so metamorphic minerals are formed during the metamorphic process. So there are particular minerals that are indicative of the way that a particular rock was formed. So certain minerals will only form under certain pressure and temperature conditions and they tell us something about the way the metamorphic rock formed. And so we can look at a particular mineral. So you see quartz will form across low grade to high grade, feldspar, same thing. But there are some of these others like garnet that will only form in a particular range. So intermediate to high grade. And so <clears throat> here we have mineral composition and then increasing metamorphism is towards the higher grade. And then rock time down here at the bottom. Once you get into the highest grade, you start to see melting and it starts to turn into an igneous rock. And then we have no alteration at too low of a grade. In between, we have slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss, and those are our four foliated metamorphic rocks. Okay, And it'll kind of show you what you might see in each of those rock types. Okay, So metamorphic... Um, rocks can get quite complicated, um, but simply we can separate them from low grade, intermediate grade, and high grade, depending on the crystals that are present and the pressure, temperature, depth conditions in which they formed. So if they formed at the highest pressure, highest temperature, greatest depth, they would be considered high grade metamorphic rocks. So on this image back here, the highest grade would be nice of these four rocks. Okay, and the lowest grade would be slate. Okay, so slate would be in this lower grade where it formed under lower pressure, lower temperature, lower depth conditions. Okay. And then from there, we can form them into what we call mineral assemblages. So based on the pressure, temperature, depth conditions, and the mineral assemblages, so what minerals you see, we can separate them into something called a metamorphic facies. So these are these terms that you see, hornfell, zeolite, blue schist, green schist, eclogite, amphibolite. Those are different metamorphic facies that the rocks can be separated into based on their pressure, temperature conditions, and the minerals that are found in them. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to know all that. I just want to introduce it. Um, that way you are familiar with what all of those things actually are. Um, and you're going to see that the highest um, grade of metamorphic assemblages, sorry, metamorphic bases are going to be found from subduction zones. So subduction zones are going to give us our most altered metamorphic rocks, whereas contact metamorphism is going to give us some of our lowest grade metamorphic rocks. Okay. So here are those four that I was showing you, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss, and kind of where they would be found in the crust if you were looking at a um, continental continental collision so slate would be 
further near the surface, then phyllite, and then schist, and then gneiss. And you can kind of see that their crystals are vastly different. You see much finer grain in the slate versus the gneiss. Okay, so how do we classify metamorphic rocks? They are classified by their texture and their composition. Composition being their mineralogy or their chemistry. And each rock, each metamorphic rock has what we call a protolith. A protolith is a parent rock from which the metamorphic rock derived from. So wherever it came from, the original rock it was before it was metamorphosed is the protolith. Okay, so protoliths, like I kind of said in the beginning, I didn't use that term, can be igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, or other metamorphic rocks. So if I was looking at a gneiss, I would say that the protolith of a gneiss is a granite. So granite is what the rock started as, and as it was metamorphosed, it changed into a gneiss. Okay, so this is the identification chart that you would use in um, lab. So we have our foliated metamorphic rocks and our non-foliated. That's the texture term that I'm looking for, is whether it's foliated or non-foliated. From there, we can say that they're very fine, they're fine, medium to coarse, um, medium to coarse, or we can say that they're medium to coarse to fine in the non-foliated, okay? And there's some kind of pictures here to help you distinguish that. So we talked about slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. So some of the main differences there is that slate and phyllite are made from shale, and then phyllite is made from slate, okay? So it gives the parent rock over here. Um, and they are going to have grains in them because they're made from sedimentary rocks. Schist is oftentimes made from phyllite, and you see the creation of micas in, which is what this micaceous minerals is referring to. So you see muscovite and biotite being created, and it gives it kind of a scaly foliation. So it kind of looks sort of like an amphibian um, if it was a rock. And then gneiss is formed primarily from granite. And that is going to show you the black and white banding. So you can kind of see that in this image here. And these guys on the bottom, anthracite coal is that black one I showed you earlier that's, that I said was non-foliated. And it is formed from bituminous coal, which is made from altered plant fragments, right? So it's carbon, basically. So anthracite coal is basically bituminous coal, further metamorphosed, further buried. Okay. So it's going to be black, low density. It's going to be a little bit shinier than the bituminous coal. Marble and quartzite are non-foliated rocks that have interlocking crystals of quartz and calcite. So marble is made up of primarily calcite from limestone. So limestone is calcium carbonate rich. And when it recrystallizes under metamorphic conditions, it will make marble. So you're probably familiar with marble. It's really popular in decor and stuff now. But... Um, marble in the field, I'll show you some photos, is not the same as marble that you get from home goods, right? Um, so it will react with acid, and it's going to look a lot like quartzite. Quartzite and marble are hard to distinguish between in hand specimen, um, but quartzite will scratch glass because it's made of quartz sandstone, and quartz sandstone will scratch glass, and it will not react with acid. Marble will react with acid because it contains the calcium carbonate that is the base that re is reacting with the acid. Okay. So let's look at some parent rocks and see if you can match them up. So we have samples 41, 42, 21, 36, 2, and 25. Let's see if you can match them up. Take a minute and then we will... So pause the video if you need to. So which ones do you think are parents and then which parent do you think belongs to which metamorphic rock? Okay, so take a second, pause the video if you need, and then we will give it a try. Okay, so which ones off the bat are metamorphic rocks? So it should be pretty easy that 36 is a metamorphic rock because it's foliated. And it may be a little bit harder to see, but 21 has grains in it and 25 looks chalky. Both of those things cannot be present in metamorphic rocks. They wouldn't survive the pressure temperature conditions. So 41 and 42 are more likely our metamorphic rocks. So knowing that, which one do you think 36 belongs to? Which is parent rock? Granite, right? So number two belongs to number 36. 
Okay, without testing for acid, it might be kind of difficult to distinguish which 41 or 42 is marble or quartzite. Um, but one of the things that I like to tell students, I don't know if it helps, <laughs> but if you were trying to make, let's say, caramel, and you have water and sugar in a pot, and you don't let the sugar completely dissolve yet into making the caramel, and you take it off the, the heat, and then you let it solidify on the counter or something, I think it would look like this number 42 here. That's quartzite. That's what I think quartzite kind of looks like in a real world kind of example, something that you could relate to, is sugar that's been trying to crystallize into or melt down into caramel, but hasn't made it there yet, and then recrystallized into this big block. Um, that's what I think quartzite kind of looks like. And then 41 is marble. Marble is usually a lot whiter in color than quartzite, but not always. Um, this image just happens to be. And so 41 will react with acid. The difference is that 42 um, quartzite is made of quartz sandstone. So which one do you think is the sandstone? That would be 21. So 21 is the parent rock for number 42. And then that makes 25 the limestone that is the parent rock for 41. Okay. So I know it's really hard in just images, but as you're going through this, just give, us, give it your best shot um, and we'll work through it. Images are very hard to identify rocks through, so as long as you're trying, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for here. All right, so here's another look at that. So we have granite is the parent rock for um, gneiss, mudstone is the parent rock for shale, sandstone is the parent rock for quartzite, and limestone is the parent rock, parent rock for marble. Okay. So we talked about textures already a little bit. We talked about non-foliated versus foliated. So um, depending on what the foliation looks like, you're going to see a different metamorphic rock, right? So if it's slaty, those are the microscopic orientation of grains. So that would be in your slate. Um, if it has a schistose <laughs> texture, that's all of the micas. Um, that's a fancy term for saying that the micas are all foliated. Um, a nisic texture would be the black and white banding. And the philitic texture is the parallel alignment of the microscopic micas. So they're not coarse micas like you see in the schist or the schistose foliation. Um, they're microscopic, so you can't necessarily see them. You will see their shine on the phyllite, but you won't necessarily see the mineral. Okay, so the two slate and phyllite are hard to tell the difference between um, because the grains are microscopic. But the difference here is that slate is made up of very dull clay, so it gives it a dull appearance. Um, phyllite is made up of the micas, the microscopic micas, which gives it a sheen. So phyllite will have a little bit of a sheen to it, and slate will be more dull. Okay. They're very similar to each other, though. The schist is going to look something more like this. Remember I said it was a little bit scaly? Sometimes it comes with these beautiful large garnets, so these little red soccer balls that we saw in minerals. So garnets will be throughout the mineral. Um, they're not necessarily foliated, but the micas, so the shiny minerals that you see are all foliated. You can kind of see them layered, run on top of each other, parallel to themselves. Schists are not always that color. They come in a variety of colors. You can see green schist, blue schist, um, and then these are garnet schists that have large garnets in them, okay? And that depends on the minerals that are present. So like in the green schist, for example, it contains chlorite. And chlorite is a mineral that will change uh, the micas to a green appearance. Then we have nice. This is a different look at a nice. We've looked at some really fresh surfaced nice. So you see the black and white banding. Here you can see some of the oxidation on this sample which is what that um, red orangey color is on this rock. And the crystals are a little bit finer, so it's not a very sharp transition here. They're very thin layers of parallel minerals. But you still see the segregation of the felsic minerals and the mafic minerals, so the dark and light separation. Remember, the dark minerals are fels, or sorry, mafic, and the light minerals are felsic. Here's another look at it. These are more of what we've been seeing with the dark um, and light segregation here. 
right? And then we get into the non-foliated metamorphic rocks. So these are uh, the ones that are not foliated. They're not formed from directed pressure at all. So these are contact or um, hydrothermal metamorphism. Okay, so marble is one that we've already looked at. This is marble in um, the field. So this would be like a road cut or something where marble has not been polished and cut and um, the you know most pretty marble. So most of the marble that is the very nice white color is um, from the Carrara mine in Italy, which I was oh, so sadly supposed to visit this you know summer of 2020, but I was not able to. <laughs> um, and so Carrara mine, the Carrara mine in Italy, it's like in central Italy, central central western Italy. Um, is a beautiful mine that has beautiful, very pure um, white marble. Um, it doesn't look like this <laughs> necessarily, but if you look at marble in California that you might see, this is more of what you're going to see. Um, it's very tainted, if you will. It has a lot of other things kind of intermingled with it, and this one has been oxidized at the surface. So here is one that you would see in Death Valley, actually. So this is Mosaic Canyon in Death Valley where it's been polished naturally by water. Um, and again, limestone is the parent rock to marble. So here's a more um, example of what a Carrara mine marble might look like. Then we get into quartzite. That was the rock that I told you looks like almost, almost melted uh, sugar, but then has been taken off the pot and then solidified. That's what um, this one is. So this is quartzite. It's made from quartz sandstone. It has a lot of interlocking quartz crystals, but it doesn't have that nice transparent look to the quartz anymore. Okay, but the quartz has started to recrystallize from the sandstone. So it started as this quartz sandstone and it is slowly recrystallized over time into this quartzite. When things start to melt, what melts first is the felsic minerals. Remember at 50 kilometers in depth, we start to see the melting of the felsic minerals, but not necessarily the dark mafic minerals. And so some metamorphic rocks, we will say, have been partially melted, um, and they're kind of in that transition zone between being metamorphic and becoming igneous. Going back to the rock cycle, this is the last time I will talk about it. The rock cycle shows that any rock can aspire to become a any other type of rock. So this is a little bit different than the one I've showed you before. This is a little bit more in depth. So we have sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous rocks. Remember, in order to become a sedimentary rock, it has to go through erosion, deposition, lithification. Okay. In order to become a metamorphic rock, it has to go through heat and pressure. Igneous, it has to melt, cool, and solidify. Okay. So this gives you all directions for the rock cycle. This is something you're going to want to know. On an exam, you will be required to actually draw this out um, in some fashion, okay, or fill it out, okay? So that's the end of Metamorphic Rocks, and I will see you guys in the next video.